just so if there's noise in the hallway. We'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic which stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And Missoula County acknowledges that this event takes place on the Aboriginal territories of the Salish and Kalispell people. Um, Public announcements. Are there any? Are there any public comments on items not on the agenda? Claims received as of July 14th to July 20th um, by the commissioner's office are $2,681,590.93. And you can go to the county website and drill down if you have any questions about specific items. Uh, we have three hearings today. Um, we'll get started with Heidi West with Community Development Block Grant Housing Rehabilitation Application. And how these hearings will go will be a staff report um, followed by the developer or the uh, project manager report. Um, then there's We'll open it up for public comment. Please keep your comments to three minutes. We'll try to time you and help you out. And then uh, we'll close public comment and then the commissioners will discuss. OK, Heidi, it's all yours. Great, thank you. So um, I'm obviously coming from you uh, virtually, um, but I'm also joined in person by my colleague, Cindy Kennedy. Um, and I'll go ahead and share my screen. Um, second. This is my first time to present, uh, and I am chose to do it virtually, which is challenging. All right, let me know if you can see the presentation. There we go, yes. All right, thank you. Um, all right, so uh, we are here to present on Missoula County's application to the Montana Department of Commerce Community Development uh, Community Development Block Grant, or CDBG, Housing Stabilization Program. Also with us are Jim Morton and Ruth Burke from the District 11 Human Resource Council, uh, who will provide program-specific details and answer questions. This is our second public hearing in the grant application process, and it's intended to provide notice of our application and the scope of the proposed project to the public and also provide an opportunity for public comment. Uh, Missoula County is applying for a non-competitive CDBG housing stabilization grant to continue an owner-occupied housing rehabilitation program. This program currently exists in Missoula County and HRC is our program partner. If this application is successful, Missoula County will enter into an additional five-year agreement with the Montana Department of Commerce and funds will be made available on a project-by-project -project basis. Our goal is to rehabilitate a minimum of 10 homes during the next, uh, during those five years. Uh, the CDBG Housing Stabilization Program funds can be used in a variety of ways, but this application is specific to owner-occupied single-family housing rehabilitation. This is in line with the recently approved Missoula County Housing Action Plan Breaking Ground. The owner-occupied housing rehabilitation program specifically meets goal two, which is to support programs and funding to help county residents afford housing. It also utilizes clearly defined action steps within the policy to mitigate existing housing challenges. These are action 2.2, which is to preserve low cost market rate housing and action 2.3, which is to rehabilitate homes occupied by low to moderate income residents. Housing was also the number one issue based on the responses during the most recent community needs assessment. The survey asked respondents to rank strategies to expand the range of housing available. Uh, sorry, I lost my spot. <laughs> and this program have, uh, captures four out of 10 defined strategies to increase housing options. It maintains a supply of affordable housing, provides resources for homeowners to rehabilitate existing homes, 
provides the opportunity to increase the accessibility for people with disabilities and also allows aging in place. And it also includes a financial counseling component. The program will be available for owner occupied single family households that earn 80% or less of area median income. Right now that is $65,000 for a family of four. Homes must also be located outside of Missoula city limits. To provide more details on specific program implementation, um, I would like to turn it over to Jim Morton and Ruth Burke from the Human Resource Council. And I think they should be present virtually uh, as well. Yep, we can see them. They're present in person, Heidi. Oh, are they? Perfect. That's even better. Hi, I'm Ruth Burke from the Human Resource Council. And I'm Jim Morton from the Human Resource Council. We'll go over briefly, but hopefully you, uh, you, there'll be questions. Um, as Heidi mentioned, this is an income restricted program and there are determinations of income that are following uh, housing room development rules. Um, in terms of rehabilitation, what we're looking at uh, is to uh, provide items that are related to the structure, the health and safety. We don't do anything cosmetic. There are lots of rules about what we can do. We do have a staff architect that will review the, the needs. Um, in terms of the process, we determine uh, the owner's equity. We'll get a market analysis, usually not an appraisal, because that, that costs the owner. Um, and we are interested in the equity part of it. Uh, we do not uh, require any particular score on a credit score. Um, we want to make sure that we're aware of the liens, so we do a, a, a check with the title company. So if somebody has the equity, maybe they have bad credit, that's fine with us. So the benchmark for that is that we have an 80% equity so that um, we explain all of that um, during the, the uh, application. Um, our loan officer will go through the documents. We do take a lien on the property. Uh, we will take a third lien, to, again, depending on the equity, we add up all of that. Uh, the idea is to be as understanding as possible to get out there and get the job done. Um, the other part of that, we emphasize is the loan. You know, a lot of folks are not used to going, getting loans, all the documents, the liens. So part of the process is to explain that. That's also a requirement that HUD has for the, the loan. Um, so our loan officer explains what a lien is, how that's filed, explains all the documents of the promissory note and any deed of trust that we file. Um, and then after all of that, and the architect has met with the owner. We ask the owner what their needs are and how they see their own home, because that's important. It is their home, and we want to make sure we we are respectful of that. Again, there are things that we cannot do because of the rules regarding the um, the program. So, as I said, we don't do cosmetic. But if it's health and safety, um, if there's an obvious code violation, uh, we will try to address that. As you know, the code is an ever evolving document. Um, things might have been permitted 20 years ago and they still might be allowable. Uh, so we take that in consideration. Um, there are always going to be gray areas. Somebody has a fence, for instance, but it may have lead based paint that's chipping and peeling. We may think that's a detriment to the neighborhood. We might have to ask the state of Montana if that is something that is not cosmetic. If it's cosmetic, we can't do it. But those are gray areas where we try to do the best we can. Um, so Ruth, do you want to talk about the rehab? Um, so the process begins with an uh, application, a complete application from the applicant, from the, the borrower, the homeowner. Um, the loan officer then looks at the income eligibility. We look at whether or not the items that we're going to be performing on the home are, fit that criteria that Jim had said. We do an inspection, uh, so our staff architect goes out, meets with the homeowner at the site, and fills out a form that dictates what uh, what code violations or what um, health and safety issues, in addition to whatever the homeowner might have identified that they want to do. Um, it, once the um, items are the scope of what we're going to be doing is identified, then um, the homeowner looks for bids on those items. We try to get three bids 
and in this um, market, I'd say that we don't always get two bids. We we make attempts to get as many as we can. Usually, uh, we just document, or we end up documenting that we've attempted numerous times, and and you know what the current bid is. It's hard to get um, the contractor scheduled. It, it takes a good amount of time, and we usually have to put down half of what the contractor payment is. Um, we uh, once the scope is determined and the bids are in, then we turn it over to the county and the county does an environmental assessment. And um, then that's turned. They look at historical. They look at um, uh, whether there's any issues, whether there there'd be any environmental issues. And in all the time that we've been doing it, I haven't seen that come back where it's been an issue. Um, and then. Uh, it's the process of the the county reviews the applicant's information, then it goes to the state for approval. Once that comes back, then we can start the actual rehab. It's a process of contracting with individual contractors, so there's not a general, or maybe the homeowner would be considered the general, and then uh, each of the jobs that might be done, a roof or uh, basement stairs or whatever it might be, then those are usually contracted out to individual contractors. They sign a contract with the homeowner and our loan officer coaches them on what that contract should look like. And each time there's a draw on the money, the homeowner approves the draw and reviews it with the home, uh, with our housing person. Um, and then close to the end of the whole process, when the job is done, there's a closeout process where we have to um, provide all the documentation to the county and then the county provides to the state. And then uh, we can ask for draws during the time period. So if uh, if we have cash out on the project and the project is extended, then we can ask for a draw on it. But we typically are have been waiting till the contract was done before we're asking to be funded. Um, uh, let's see. So then the closeout of the project um, includes any of the final draws that we might have, and it includes all the documentation related to what was done and and our inspector's report that he went out and made sure that it was done, and the homeowner also approves that uh, all the work has been done. And then um, as a final comment, it's pretty common, or what we see in those kinds of jobs is uh, we might do a roof replacement, uh, we might do windows and doors. We do energy conservation measures. We see heating and plumbing replacements pretty often. And those are kind of the typical things that we might see. One of the, this is a contract between the, the Missoula County and the Department of Commerce and you subcontract. So that's why we're explaining kind of that process um, because you are ultimately uh, responsible. <laughs> so we get that. Uh, one of the things that ID mentioned is that we're going to do a minimum. The way that the Department of Commerce has structured this particular community development block grant is that we do one at a time, which we understand from our point of view is inefficient. Uh, we think. Chuck, can you use? Yeah, there you yeah, go. In this environment, we could do better if we could do, let's say, uh, five roofs at a time. That gets the contractor. To, uh, you know, to plan out and mobilize, but that's not allowed. So we have to complete the work. As we said, do a closeout, which is a term of art for, for CDBG, before we can start another project. So that's why we're saying we can only do two at a time. Um, that is something I'm sure you and your staff have lamented as we have, that, that it is with all the work that needs to be done and this environment where Contractors are having a hard time with labor shortage. People are not going into the construction trades. Um, and if we could go out to that uh, labor market, I mean, to the contractors and say, here's, you know, five or 10 homes, here's what they need. But we, we could get things done quicker, but those are the rules. So certainly we want to answer any questions you might have. And the other comment I might have is that we, uh, this is a continuation. We're currently operating the program. It, our contract ends in December, and then this is a continuation. So we have already done outreach, and we have uh, 13 people that are on our wait list for this kind of services. We're estimating 10 will be done in the next five years. So um, unless we need to go out for outreach, it's unlikely that we would um, do more outreach. 
a couple questions for you. So just to make sure that I, I understand, I might have missed something, so I apologize in advance for that. This is a loan. This loan is paid back upon transfer of the property. There is no month to month debt service, is correct. that correct? correct? I feel like that's an essential piece of this yes. because people who own houses typically have a bit of equity, could go to a bank to get a loan. Uh, but folks who are in the situation you're talking about with these income minimums wouldn't be able to meet the, wouldn't be able to service that debt. And this right. is this is actually an opportunity for people who are in that income bracket to make needed repairs to their houses. Correct. I just yes. want to make just yes, want to make sure you. that yeah. that was clear, especially for our audience here today. Yes. So second piece of this, what are you guys doing to attempt to change the rules so that you can do more than one project at a time? As it is, the goal does not seem meetable. Yeah, we have for this has been an ongoing discussion for some years. Uh, again, uh, there are three communities that receive these funds directly. We have, you know, Billings, Great Falls and Missoula, those three cities. Otherwise, the counties and towns and cities are uh, the grantees. So throughout the state, um, those jurisdictions have asked for changes. Uh, we've not seen them, but yes, we continually suggest the Department of Commerce that I think it's a budgetary concern with them because they they don't they reserve this money and then if if there's too much usage, they can stop it. So that's that's one of the arguments that I've heard instead of just giving us a dollar amount. So we do the city program, as Ruth mentioned, and they gave us a dollar amount, so many months to get it done. So we know it can be done because it's the same money, but that's not how they do it. We have a new director of Department of Commerce. It, and they seem very business friendly and want to see action happen. So I strongly encourage you guys to yeah, yeah. not have the sense that, oh, this is a dead thing. We just have to live with it, but really continue to pursue change. And I think you may have more receptive ears now than in the yes. past. Yeah, good point. Yeah, thank thank you both. Uh, and just to follow up on that, please do lean on us. And, and I think we've had any number of conversations about this very topic before where as valuable as this program is, it, it does seem awfully process rich and uh, and if there's a way to streamline it and actually get more work done on the ground by way of not just kind of doling these things out sequentially but uh, taking more uh, uh, significant bites out of it um, we would be all for that and and i think we would stand ready to uh, engage directly with montana department of commerce on that topic yeah yes good points yep thank you heidi did you want to add to that? Yeah, so I have one more slide. Um, and I think we are, um, I, the Department of Commerce just came out with their new allocation plan for this year, and we are planning on commenting on that as well. Um, this program has a limited amount of funds that are being spent between, uh, across the whole state, um, which makes implementation challenging. Um, but uh, uh, our next steps um, here are to finalize uh, collecting the public comment. We also posted about this project on Missoula County Voice, and we received uh, 14 site visits and two comments. Um, one was an exuberant um, support of this application, and the other one wanted to uh, ask us to ensure that this funding will be spent in the county. Um, so uh, over the next couple of days, we'll find and finalize gathering the public comment, and then we hope to submit this application by the end of August. And then if we are successful in this application, we hope that the next round of rehabilitation projects can start in the spring of 2023. So at this point, um, that's the end of our application. So um, I'd love to hear what folks have to say. Thank you. Great, thanks. Well, is there anyone in the room who has comments or questions? Come on up. Not all here for this hearing. <laughs> <laughs> We don't see anyone in the room. Is there anyone online or on the phone? Okay, well, it's open. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Heidi. Thank you. Okay, all right. go ahead. You ready for a motion? I don't think. Oh, okay, yeah. I'm ready. We're Sorry. good. Okay. okay. We'll move on to um, our second hearing. This is the uh, second hearing for the road alteration of petition for Bitterroot Road right of way.
Sam Scott. Good afternoon, commissioners. Sam Scott with the clerk and recorder. So today we have our second hearing for the Bitterroot Road alteration petition that our office received a month or so ago. Um, before we get started with that hearing, I wanted to mention two things real quickly. First, Larry Evans, the petitioner, should be here today, and I want to make sure that he gets an opportunity to speak for the petition before we get too far along with the hearing today. Secondly, um, Boone Carlberg Law Office yesterday submitted another petition to our office to abandon this same right of way. So um, it is currently being reviewed by our office. We're uh, going through the signature verification process. We'll have that wrapped up soon and you'll see it on an upcoming agenda. But I just wanted to put that on your radar before we get started. And I know that Steve has a road viewers report too. I don't know if we want to do that next or open it up. Great, thanks. Steve Nide. What'd you do to me? <laughs> Steve Nide, Missoula County Surveyor's Office. Um, we did a site visit and I've got the wrong date here. <laughs> July 26th, right? Tuesday. Um, Josh Slotnick, Commissioner, myself, and I will just read what I've written. That makes it easier. At approximately 3.30 p.m., the investigators listed above, Deputy County Attorney John Hart, Public Works Director Shane Stack, along with several petitioners and affected landowners, viewed the improved portion of the petitioner's requested alternate location for the right-of-way. No recommendation is being made at this time. I know that's a very brief report, but we certainly anticipate additional public comment and an additional site visit by all of the commissioners, I believe, in early August, August the 9th, I believe it's scheduled for, um, three o'clock, two o'clock. I don't know the exact time, but it is August. Two o'clock, I'm pretty sure it was. And let's plan on meeting at the intersection of Lower Miller Creek Road and Haugen Drive. We'll get together there and then um, decide where we want to head first. Two o'clock. Two o'clock. August 9th. Thank you. Is there any other? John, do you have anything to add? Okay, is there public comment? And then again, just a reminder, state your name and uh, keep it to your comment to three minutes because I think there's a lot of folks that want to speak. OK, my name's Larry Evans. Um, I'm the petitioner, I guess. Uh, the fact that we weren't here last meeting doesn't indicate in any way that we weren't interested. We weren't notified, so we didn't know about the meeting, and that's why none of us were here. We're here today. Um, I'd like to say that at the commissioner's meeting, Last time, there were several opponents to the petition to alter the right public right away who voiced their concerns about facilitating access to the Bitterroot River and the adjacent FWP parcel. Most were concerned that the establishment of a roadway uh, with the general location of the right of way as depicted in GLO maps and other surveys would have serious negative consequences and impacts to the ecosystem and landowners. This petition doesn't seek to establish that roadway. In fact, approval of this, of this petition will prevent the establishment of such a roadway by moving the right of way to an existing road. Some opponents seem to feel that the public should be denied access to a publicly owned resource, citing substantially equivalent access via other points along the river. As one who is now experiencing the effects of COVID, I assure you a mile long hike does not constitute equivalent access. It may be argued that to suggest such a hike is discriminatory and even or discriminatory to those with even a minor disability, such as myself. Uh, there's recently been new construction along the Haugen Drive in the area of the general location of the existing right of way, and this raises some questions. Does this right of way run through the Artie Doris property or the Ryan Salisbury property? 
or does it mean that the Oxbow farm to market building or the city's utility building um, are going to be required to move if during a subsequent survey they're found to be on that right away? And how about future buyers? Do they need to be concerned that an, a right of way is going to be a problem for them and their title? Uh, Mr. Salisbury has stated that he did his due diligence when they bought their property and saw no reference to this road or this right of way because it, GLO maps aren't consulted. Is that going to be somebody else's problem? The commissioners can answer these questions and settle the issue for today and the future by asserting that it doesn't matter where the right of way is or where it was and simply moving its location to the existing roadway. Now there is a precedent for approval of this petition. Resolution 2004-006 was approved by Missoula County Commissioners on this particular road for the following reasons. These three roads are not locatable on the ground and relocating these roads moves them to an existing roadway easement. That was good in 2013, should be good today. Now, as somebody stated, um, there is another petition regarding the section of road. And Bart Morris at the site survey stated he would be petitioning the commissioners to abandon the right of way. This action, I believe, is outside the authority of the commissioners as Montana code annotated states. The board may not abandon a county road or right of way used to provide legal existing legal access to public land or waters. Larry, you just hit three minutes, man. OK, well, the rest of this stuff is uh, we'll we'll take the written comment for sure. OK, it'll be available online there. there I do want to point out that uh, if you want to know more about how this same situation was resolved elsewhere in the state recently, um, the link to that website is going to be in the letter that'll be online. Thank, Thank you. you. And you can leave it with uh, Violet. Right there. Right, right here. Oh. Thank you. I'll try to be brief. Um, three minutes goes quickly. My name is Sandy Evans. I live on Haugen Drive. I fully support this petition, um, but this petition is not to create a new road or to provide new public access um, to the Bitterroot River or the FWP property. This already exists, so we're not asking for something new. We're asking for access to something that exists. Um, the problem is currently the existing public road or the existing um, legal public right of way isn't available to the public. Um, there, we weren't at the last meeting. Um, we didn't receive notification that we were on the agenda. Um, I am one of the petitioners. Um, and so I wanna address, I did listen to the last meeting and I read all the statements that had been submitted. And I wanted to make a, a couple comments. There were many comments challenging the existence of the public road, which is Bitterroot Road. Um, the location of the public road is an accepted location used by survey companies and surveyors. And survey after survey references the Bitterroot Road. Um, Oxbow property address is 7380 Bitterroot Road. So this road exists. There's no question about the road. <laughs> Some of the comments um, also referred to um, this petition being a handful of neighbors that just want access to the river at the expense of a property owner. That is not the intent of this petition. Um, this is public access that the public to a public road and a public right of way that the public should have access to. That's what generated this petition. Mr. Dars referred to resolution 2004 as getting rid of, you know, the um, approval of that, getting rid of um, this road. Maloney Ranch Phase 8 certified survey that was part of 
the resolution for 2004-006 clearly shows the existence of this road, even though the other three roads were merged. Um, and probably one of my biggest concerns is. You don't know me. I, you know, I know you because you're public officials. You don't know me. You don't probably know any of the other petitioners, but you all know Bart Morris. You all have relationships with Bart. Um, Fish, Wildlife and Park. Has a relationship with Bart. And one of my greatest fears is that there will be influence because of this relationship on the decision for this petition and the petition to abandon the road. Sandy, you um, just hit your three minuts. Pardon? You just hit your three, three minutes. minutes. Okay, Sorry. Then you just want to let, make sure that these other folks get a chance yeah, to. Let me summarize then. So um, Bart's been on many boards. He worked for the um, Fish, Wildlife and Park parks. He has, you know, been around all of you for a long time. The existing relationship should not influence the decision on this petition. The best interest of the public needs to be the primary highest priority when when this decision is made. And I'll say one last thing about this new petition being submitted. Um, one of our neighbors brought to our attention that they were told if they didn't sign this petition to abandon that tents and bums were going to move into our neighborhood. And so using, you know, fear to get somebody to sign to sign a petition, I think is something that um, everyone should be ashamed of. Sandy, so we, we, we got we got to make getting... way for other folks. Thank you. Pardon? We need to make way for other folks. Yes. I... OK, next. I'm sorry, I wish we had a clock that you guys could see your time. Oh, I, I won't but... take more than three okay. minutes. Yes, I'm Oralee Stark. I'm just a member of the Missoula community like all of you. And I just love this, this county, this city that we live in. I'm grateful to live here. And I'm here in support of this petition. I've always been an advocate for private public uh, land that we can use our public land. And um, at this point where we have so many people moving in, I think it's a bad time to try and remove our access to our to our public lands. This is something that all of us enjoy. We love to take our kids down to fish or or jump in the river and float. Um, I think it's something that we need to really think about. And I um, just ask you as our commissioners and our leaders that you would think about this, that you will make a decision in favor of the majority of the people that really want to use our public lands. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Orly, um, next. Good afternoon, I'm Stacy Hunter. I live on Hagen Drive also. Um, our family has lived there for the past 18 years. Um, we were the first house in that development. We have six kids. We still have three remaining at home. Um, my kids have rode their bikes everywhere in that area. We've rode our four-wheelers. We've we've fished down there. We've tubed. We've um, hiked around that river. Um, it's been part of our family's memories, and it's been part of our family's life. Um, this petition is about the public and our neighborhood having the right to use the public access to a to a public um, property. I was super upset. Um, I hate to even do this, but I was super upset after the site on Tuesday. Um, there was a lot of us there, so we had to carpool down. Um, I jumped in the back seat of um, Bart Morris's truck with County Commissioner Josh Slapnick, and um, Bart and him sat up front, and myself and uh, Bart's two hired females uh, sat in the back by me. 
And after we started going, Josh being unaware that the petitioner myself was riding in Bart's truck turns to Bart and says, wow, I don't think this is a problem for you at all, Bart. After asking John Hart about the legal decision, which we discussed a lot before we headed to the site, um, John was trying to get, I mean, sorry, Josh was trying to get out of John what um, the legal part of this was. He said, it just, um, let's see, there's no legal decision, John said. It's basically just what we decide, what you guys decide. Yes, the public can use this road or no, they cannot. Um, Josh says, you'll be fine. Bart, this is not a problem for you at all. There's already two of us that don't want this to happen. It's just kind of a pain for you. Bart, knowing I was in the bag, feeling a little uneasy, started going, yeah, 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 tough decision, tough decision. It's just a bunch of my neighbors that got a little, used a word, at me. Um, just to make it clear, I'm not one of those neighbors that's ticked off at Bart Morris, but this situation in particular concerns me a lot. Um, can we as the public and the petitioners trust to get a fair verdict from our trusted county commissioners who should be looking out for our best interest of the public? It sounded to me like Josh was reassuring Bart not to worry that his decision was already made. Um, and that it was just kind of a hassle for him and a small pain for him. And I, I didn't know at the time that he Bart did have relationships with you guys. And obviously that's why you were probably so freely to talk to him. Um, but Josh also said there was two already of you that have decided that you don't want this. And I just want to remind you, this was before the site visit and before today's meeting. Um, this is upsetting to me. It's already emotional. This whole thing is emotional because this is our family's life. We have spent a lot of time there. And so personally, I feel like I wish, I hope Josh would choose to excuse himself from this um, since he had his decision made up before hearing or looking at any of the information and making an educated and a non-biased opinion um, and a the best decision in the benefit of the public. Um, I also hope that as our county commissioners, that you guys will do the right thing and stand up for the public and the public land and grant this petition as you've been chosen to do. Thank you. Thank you, Stacy. Next. Hi, my name is Doug Hunter. I'm one of the property owners. I'm sorry, can you? I can't hear very well to say that again. My name is Doug Hunter. Thank you. I'm one of the property owners that lives on Hogan Drive. Um, the wish of this, I'm a supporter of this petition. Uh, the wish of this petition is that the commissioners um, will give a non-biased look into the evidence of the current road right away known as the Bitterroot Road, AKA Bitterroot Trail, to confirm that no law has been passed that legally abandons this road. And if the roadway is confirmed, it is petitioned that this road right away be relocated to an existing roadway that they have since mentioned. I was able to go back and listen to some of the conversation from the prior meeting. And uh, I'm in agreement with Mr. Bart Morris uh, in the comment that he said he didn't want to bring any unwanted crime element with traffic into the area. Uh, any additional traffic can always bring good or bad elements. Um, however, the Oxbow did place a small store on the west side of Hogan Drive and it's open to the public where they can sell some of their beef. It would seem that at that point when they put that in, that the additional traffic was not so much of a concern. On Tuesday at the site visit, we were able to travel the road that's being proposed to access the FWP parcel by the public. Um, this road's never been treated as a public road. Um, prior to Dr. Wendy Morris and Bart Morris owning the Oxbow, those of us who lived out there used to get permission to go out and access this area from the prior owners. This was all done knowing that not knowing that there was a possible road right away. Um, we didn't know about the road right away possibility until this petition came out. Um, so if this road was to be used um, for the FWP parcel access um, during the site visit, we noticed that there is some fencing alongside the road. So with that possibility, the Oxbow cattle could be protected from any kind of traffic that goes through there. Another thing that was noticed, there must be some sort of an agreement between Oxbow and Mr. Uh, John Mead to access his property between the two of them. I wonder if that can continue just with the rest of us. Um, since Dr. Morris and Bart put the Oxbow in the conservation of the Five Valleys Land Trust back in 2017, there's been access to hunting, which is great. 
Um, however, during the hunting season, a lot of the hunters that are trying to access that property of the oxbow to hunt are not able to go in the main entrance of the oxbow because it's a locked gate and there's a tractor behind it. Um, so what the hunters do is they come into the Haugen Drive uh, area in the neighborhood and they park at the corner of Haugen Drive and Tegan Court. It's a T intersection. Now at that intersection, there's also community mailboxes in place. And so at this T intersection, when you have the park hunters parking there and then you have sidewalk access, you have the community members who are parking their cars, getting their mail through traffic going through there, this, this intersection gets quite um, congested. Uh, but once the, the hunters have parked, they access the Oxbow property via gate between two private properties. Um, if this current roadway uh, was the Bitterroot Road, aka the Bitterroot Trail, um, was open to the public, then these hunters could park along that road and access the hunting area from both sides of the road. Um, or I guess if the Oxbow wanted, they could have them park at their store and they could access it from there. Again, the, the sole purpose and wish of this petition is that you guys give a non-look bias into the existence of the current road right away known as the Bitterroot Road, the Bitterroot Trail, and to confirm that no law has been passed to legally abandon this road. Then if the road right away is confirmed, it is petitioned that the road right away be relocated to the existing roadway has been mentioned uh, that goes through the Oxbow. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Next. Hello, commissioners. I am Bart Morris. I own Oxbow Cal Company with my wife, Wendy Morris, and um, I just wanted to, I spoke last time, I wanted to speak again. So I'm in, I'm here in support of the new petition brought in front of you to abandon the unused county road known as the 1867 GLL road that crosses our Oxbow, Oxbow Cattle Company property in section 14 of Township 12 North and Range 20 West. I know that hasn't been approved by the clerk of court yet, but when it is, I guess I'm a little ahead of myself here. Reason, reasons I'm in support of this petition, Mayor, the reasons I was in opposition of the previous petition to alter this wagon road to the road that runs through the heart of our ranch. I don't want to repeat these reasons as you all heard them at the first hearing. The one thing I do want to reiterate is the amount of support we had in opposition of this road. We had folks in opposition of this road from Community Food and Agri Agriculture Coalition, Western Sustainability Exchange, neighbors, individuals that currently recreate on these FWP parcels, Missoula County law enforcement, and Missoula County, County citizens that value wild spaces, agriculture, healthy soils, and ecosystems that this road would threaten. With that said, I believe the best thing that the commission can do is deny the petition to alter the wagon road and accept a new petition to abandon it. There are 25 access points along the Bitterroot River from the confluence of the East and West Fork to where it dumps into the Clark Fork according to the Bitterroot River access map from 2008. The FWP parcel that this road would access currently has four access points within four miles of it. Ranchette Park provides vehicular and pedestrian access to the east side of the Bitterroot rest the less than one mile upstream and the Riverside Park in Lolo is less than a quarter of a mile from these parcels. Recreators use Highway 93 and the new bike path to access these FWP parcels and floaters then take out at Buckhouse Bridge. Reason I bring all this up is 16% of the access points along the 70 mile long river are within four miles of this FWP parcel and three of them are less than a mile away. This tells me there is substantial access to these parcels. In fact, I was there, I was in there three days this spring putting up fence and every time I was in there, I ran into folks recreating on this land. Two of those hunters I contacted later and they gave um, letters of opposition against this. Um, another one showed up here at the last hearing. Um, the best thing we can do for the future of our community is to abandon this wagon road and protect the resources we currently have by not putting a public access point right through the middle of them. Just last week, we had the community um, engagement coordinator from the Bitterroot Water Forum out working on restoration project on our pl place with volunteers that this road would bisect. And this is what Alex wrote. We know the news lately can sometimes feel gloomy, so we want to brighten your day with a hopeful moment from our Miller Creek restoration site. And he had a photo of a um, Western Monarch caterpillar. He said, this Western Mon Monarch caterpillar pattern. Sorry, Bart, okay. you threw it. I'll leave this here. Thank yeah. you. Thank you.
Good afternoon. My name is Mary Albrand and I live on Oral Zumwalt Way. Um, I was here at the last hearing and my husband Thomas Albrandt was also here. He is a geomorphologist and he presented a report to you about the physical impact to that property that regardless of whether there is a right of way on it, whether there's going to be, um, whether there was a road, um, the fact that that particular area, that land that's involved is in a, it has already been decided, it is in a conservation easement. It also lies in a floodplain. So the actual act of building any kind of access to that, we're talking about building an access that's over a mile long through a floodplain. So um, I would just like, that's my question, is that, is that going to be taken into account when you're making your decision? That's all, thanks. Thank you, Mary. Hello, my name is Ruben Fry. I'm a Missoula resident, conservationist, avid outdoorsman, and public access proponent, and I am firmly in opposition to this uh, proposed public access. Um, I used the area where this uh, road would access um, coming in from above stream and taking out downstream, and uh, the arguments that were made earlier about it not being accessible are just not true. And if you want to access an easy access point where you can drive up to almost the edge of the river, there are dozens of those all around Missoula. We don't have a problem with river access in Missoula. But the problem that would happen here if this, so the other argument was that we're not building a new road, we're using a road that's existing and making public easement. But you are creating a huge traffic situation and human use situation in an area that is currently a really rare spot for river bottom wildlife habitat. Uh, I observe many different types of animals when I recreate in that area, and most of them I don't see anywhere else around Missoula because there's very little human traffic and there's no development here. So from the standpoint of conservation, I feel like it's a really bad move to increase access to this already publicly accessible place, albeit a little more difficult, and uh, disturb all that wildlife habitat. Uh, also, the river itself would be an issue. I think the point at which the access would be on the FWP parcel uh, I'm pretty familiar with that exact location and the river runs into the bank right there and it looks pretty unstable from my view. What's going to happen is a lot of people are going to be using that shoreline, trammeling it, getting rid of the vegetation somewhere along the line. If it gets as much use as is probable, you're probably going to have to develop parking space or something there. So we're talking about developing an area which is currently not really an area found elsewhere in the river valleys around here. It's it's a long section of river that is a refuge for habitat for wildlife that they don't have access to other places that are developed or heavily used. And the other part of it is being a public user, my experience and my friends, I have numerous friends who also use this area, so it's not unused, believe me, but it is used much less than say Sharon through town, say Kelly Island, say, you know, upstream on the Bitterroot. And I don't understand. So it's kind of like, what are we gaining? What are we losing? Uh, we are not really gaining much by having another high use access point. We have those all over the place. What we're losing is the last piece of intact river bottom habitat for conservation and for public user experience, which is already being utilized that way. So I just am firmly in opposition to this as a public access proponent in general, because there already is public access and what's there, I mean, is going to be diminished or gone. And that's happening all across the state and the country. Quite honestly, I mean, yeah, it's public land, but it's these public lands are managed in different ways so that they aren't completely trampled and devoid of wildlife. Because if you were to just have a road and a parking lot at every public access point, it would just become a, an amusement park pretty much. And this is a very, this is a little gem in the Missoula area that would be gone if this high traffic, high use area were to go through. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Ruben. Hello, um, my name is Dave Mead. Uh, my wife Marilyn and I own the property that's under dispute here along with Oxwell. A few things I'm not going to reiterate I'm, my opposition to this that I voiced last time, but there is a couple of things that have been said today that are just wrong. Um, one, well, maybe not wrong, but they need clarification. 
when we were out there at the site visit on Tuesday, I forget who it was, I asked Steve for a direct um, opinion on whether that road is public or private presently. And it is private. It always has been. The road that you're, or that the petition wants to move it to has never been a public road. True, it is called Bitterroot Road, but that has only been since 2013. When we bought the property, prior to that, it was NHN, no address. When we bought the property, the county randomly, supposedly, assigned the name Bitterroot Road to that private road. So I want to clarify that. It is not Bitterroot Road as from 1870. Um, and Larry Evans mentioned this resolution in 2004 and the reasoning for the commissioners to relocate that road at the time were these three roads are not locatable on the ground, much like the Bitterroot Road here presently, and relocating these road moves them to an existing roadway easement, which this petition would too. Um, but the big difference, the huge difference, is that this 2004 resolution moved them to Lower Miller Creek Road, which is a public road. This resolution looks to take land away from two private landowners, period. It's private road. You're not moving it to a public road. And so there's a huge difference in, those, in, in that action, I think. Now, Mrs. Hunter referred to her historic use of the property for... I don't know how many years. Um, it's always been private property, and I know the ranch manager, and to my knowledge, he never gave her permission. So maybe trespassing is a way of life for their family. I don't know, but there certainly will be a lot of trespassing if this site is utilized as they want. There will be no oversight by the county and probably not FWP either. They don't have the resources or the manpower to do it. So, you know, people in my experience right now, don't have much respect for private property boundaries. And when they're on the end of a dead end road down next to the river like that, I guarantee they will be all over our place. And I don't wanna deal with it. And I don't think it's right to expect us to deal with it. Um, I think the petition to abandon the road is the proper thing in this case. I thank you for your time. Thank you, Dave. Hold on, Larry. We want to see if there's anyone else who wants to speak in this room. Okay. Okay. Oh, there, I can see it. I'm Libby McClay, and I rise in opposition of opening the lower Miller Creek Road. I am a proponent of agriculture. I've been in agriculture most of my life. Um, yeah. I was not um, aware of the CE on the land that Bart owns, yes. which is, is fortunate for the people that live in the cross in their houses looking at it, because what they're going to be doing with opening this road is running a perfectly successful agriculture business out of business. And if he hadn't a CE on that, he certainly could turn that property into houses. Fortunately, those people won't have to be looking at houses, but they can look at a difference in the wildlife, the birds, the insects, whatever lives in that green space could be certainly damaged by all the impact of increased people coming and going. I have quite a bit outlined here that you can read later. That's basically my position. Thank you. Thank you, Libby. Anyone else like to speak in the room? Good afternoon. Um, my name is Thomas Bergenon. I'm here on behalf of one of the uh, affected landowners, Big Hill Property LLC. Um, and I, I don't want to reiterate any comments I made last time. Um, I, I just wanted to point out a couple of things. Um, as you heard from Ruben and from Bart Morris, um, 
our conclusion is I'm, I'm speaking, by the way, in opposition to the current petition to alter the location. Um, our conclusion is that there is adequate alternate access to the river at a number of sites. Um, Bart had a good description of where those were and how close they are. I just wanted to add that the exact fish, wildlife and park site in question is already considered to be accessed by fish, wildlife and parks via the river. And so it already has access via the river. Um, our understanding of the lore is that fish, wildlife and parks hasn't sought and doesn't appear to wish to have road access to that parcel. And I would note that fish, wildlife and parks is not on record as supporting the petition that would have the result of providing existing road access to its parcel. And they don't they don't seem to have asked the commissioners to establish such an existing road connection. Um, I agree with the folks who have concerns about the traffic impacts and the other impacts of having potentially a large number of recreationists driving on this road and parking on the road. When we were there two days ago, um, it, it was pointed out that the road is extremely narrow and it's not wide enough for two cars to pass each other on a lot of spaces. And so the road would require expensive improvements in order not to have a dangerous traffic situation. And it's not clear that any of the public agencies wants to put that um, substantial expense into managing, improving, um, and maintaining it. So I would urge you to deny the petition to alter the road and consider and accept the petition put forward by Oxbow Cattle to abandon the road. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Anyone else in the room? I know, Larry, you wanted to say something, but let's just quick check with folks online and on the phone. Is there anyone? online or on the phone, raise your hand or press star six. Okay, we don't see Larry, go ahead real quick. Come on up. Since those of us who are proponents of this petition were unable to attend the last meeting due to lack of awareness, and those people who are opponents have apparently gotten six minutes to talk about what their concerns are. I respectfully ask that we're allowed additional time to finish airing our concerns. You still have two minutes and 47 seconds. Keep going. Thank you. I just wanted to say that additionally, for those of us who take pride in our state and local heritage, this right of way may have may be historically significant as the first and oldest right of way in the state. And it would be a shame to cavalierly dismiss this quite bit of our history. <clears throat> and to respond to uh, the public comments from last time, um, there's many objections based on this lost, non-existent or unused road, but this isn't about a road. It's about relocating a right of way. And this isn't an issue about right or wrong because I agree with a lot of the complaints that the opponents have but this is about the law. The law says this was this right of way was created 160 years ago, and it cannot legally be abandoned without due process, which means to me there's probably a lawsuit or legal decisions that need to be made before it can be abandoned. Um, some people, I, I'm curious as, as to what Dr. Albrand would have to say about the existing road. I understand he did a, a geomor geomorphological analysis of the area and has an objection to roads in the, <clears throat> across the property there. Um, I understand his point, but there are roads across the area there. Um, so basically that's it. I, you know, I, I guess I've said all I can say. Um, I just would, recommend that everybody who has an interest in this really look into it and not take the comments that were made here at face value because there's a lot more to it than any of us has said and thank you for your time thank you anyone else want to comment on this item 
OK, so Steve, remind us of next steps. Well, from my perspective, the next. Step would be the August 9th. Um, congregation on site to. Let the other two commissioners that were not there at this previous viewing see for themselves what the area looks like, see for themselves what the petitioners are requesting, um, where the petitioners are requesting the right of way to be relocated, and probably just as importantly or more to kind of make a determination of are these other accesses that others have alluded to that provide public access to public lands and the river, are they comparable? Do they meet the needs of the general public? Or as the statute states, are they substantially the same as what's being considered in this petition? Substantially the same. Um, that's kind of what I think the focus would be of this next August 9th meeting. Look at that substantially the same aspect and give additional time for the commissioners and and other members of the public to to join us and and consider th the petition. Great, okay, thank you. Okay, Stromeyer would like five minutes. Oh, to speak or to? <laughs> no, I, far be it for me to take five when other folks had three. No, I just need a quick intermission. One. Oh, can I say one? Okay, one, sorry. Do one ahead, thing real quick. Just up up. I'm having knee surgery on August 9th and I won't be there. But that's okay. It's okay. It's, yeah. You can recuse yourself. Well, so. well, and you were you were there. So, I mean, that gives the other two commissioners. Well, yeah, we have a, we Do we have, have access to a helicopter? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, so everyone will take a five minute bio break and be back at 3.05. Looking forward to the next trip we get. Yeah. I know. Okay, we'll we'll bring it back together. We'll bring it back together because I know we we have a, a couple more things that I'm sorry, one more thing we got to get to. But uh, Commissioner Slotnick, you want to share? Thanks a lot. So I just want to say what Stacy said was accurate, and I will recuse myself from any decisions on this land use matter. And I apologize for what happened. Thanks. Thank you. And then uh, John Hart, you want to our next steps? Yeah, what, what I'd recommend doing with this petition to alter is, um, and I'm looking at Violet here, I, I think we should find a public hearing date sufficiently after the field trip on August the 9th, such that we can have another hearing on this petition to alter, but then also have the first hearing on the petition to abandon that Sam Scott alluded to receiving yesterday. Does that make sense? Can you repeat what John just said? Translate it. <laughs> Let's, uh, so I, I'd suggest sometime maybe in early, late August, early September. Has some time available. Okay. Okay. So we can make a decision. These guys will make a decision on both. Well, you can't, you won't be able to make a decision on the There's petition to yeah. abandon on September 1st because we'll have to go through the same statutory process for that petition. And that is, um, even though it seems unbelievably redundant, um, we should have a road viewing as the statute requires. I, I want to be a stickler with following the the statute for this issue because as we know, it's contentious and, you know, we've heard the prospect of litigation. And so uh, as your advisor, I want to make sure that we create a record that is um, that where we have followed the statutory guideline to a T redundant, though it may seem. That's great. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Yeah, just for clarification. So, Josh, would you be recusing yourself just from the petition that's currently before us or both petitions? Both of them. Okay. Thanks. OK, thank you. Those of you who are here for Bitterroot Road, you are released. <laughs> oh, 
OK, Emily Brock with Fairgrounds. Good afternoon, commissioners. Um, Billy is pulling up a presentation here. Um, my name is Emily Brock. I'm the director of land and economic development for Missoula County, as well as the director of the Missoula County Fairgrounds. This agenda item is brought to you at the request of local stakeholders from youth agriculture education programs like 4-H and FFA and from the ICE community. These thriving public program programs have called the fairgrounds their home for decades and in 4 just case uh, a century, representing some of the county's longest and strongest partnerships. Unfortunately, but not unpredictably, the Warren facilities they utilize are no longer able to safely support the demand. So today, community members are here requesting an opportunity as provided under Title 7, Chapter 77, Part 22 of Montana Code Annotated, which deals with general obligation bonds, um, to ask the voters to support facility improvements and expansion in the amount of $19 million so that more residents can access agriculture, education, and ice recreation. For over 100 years, Missoula County Fairgrounds have served our community by promoting agriculture, education, recreation, and community connection. The 46-acre acre campus is as popular as ever, in large part due to phase one renovations supported by the county. The commercial building is now one of the most popular event venues in Missoula, and we have new and existing site, we have a new and exciting partner in the Butterfly House and Insectarium. I think someone's here today, um, which is scheduled to open its doors in 2023. Last year, over 450,000 visitors enjoyed the fairgrounds, and in the 2021 Western Montana Fair had over um, 122,000 guests. So as you know, the goal of the fairgrounds master plan, which you adopted, is to make the fairgrounds a year-round place for learning activity and community connection. This phase 2A, which we're discussing today, will help achieve the vision of a thriving Missoula County fairgrounds that meets the uh, needs of our growing community. 4-H FFA, Missoula, 4-H, FFA, Missoula Area Youth Hockey Association, Glacier Hockey League, Missoula Figure Skating Club, Missoula Curling Club, University of Montana's Men's Hockey, and the Women's Hockey Association at Missoula, as well as over 9,000 public skaters, share one building at the fairgrounds. Glacier Ice Rink is scheduled to the absolute max capacity with extremely limited ice time during out-of-school hours. Meanwhile, 4-H and FFA programs use the same facility, but only have access during the summer months when the ice rinks are closed. The conversion process takes several weeks, making the facilities unavailable for any uses at all during the transition at the beginning and end of the summer. So this, these constituent groups uh, might not seem like they have a lot in common, but they do. They've come together and created this coalition here today to make this request. So while phase one was being constructed, the Missoula County 4-H Council and Livestock Committee, along with local FFA leaders, worked with architects to design an 80,000 square foot indoor livestock and equestrian center dedicated to year-round youth ag education. It's designed to provide a flexible multi-use space. Um, we've done a pro forma that predicts additional revenue from indoor Western sporting events, breed association shows, and expanded equestrian and cattle events, such as indoor rodeo. Meanwhile, representatives from the ICE community, including all the ones that I just said, <laughs> um, worked with an ICE rink architect to develop a realistic approach to achieving, achieving their long-term vision of a third sheet of ice on the fairgrounds. The new facility would have an NHL-sized rink, gender-separated locker rooms, comfortable seating areas, and more efficient refrigeration systems. Stakeholders um, um, from the ICE community also plan to use outside funding to rehabilitate the existing rinks to ensure they are safe and efficient. Of the $19 million geo bond, $8 million would go towards an indoor livestock and equestrian center. Um, $3 million would go towards green space and site work on the fairgrounds, and $8 million would be combined with private funding to build a third sheet of ice. So while 4-H and Glacier Ice Groups are leading the charge for this geo bond. They do have the support of several, several other groups. Um, fairgrounds staff are eager to host ag and equine events in the new space. And, you know, there's future programs beyond the obvious agriculture, education and trade opportunities include leadership training and equine therapy, 
uh, backcountry safety and recreation, um, and training for animal emergency response. So this um, next slide here shows the um, impact to taxpayers, um, which is a little over $7 for every $100,000 of taxable value. Um, and uh, these estimates were calculated by our finance department. And I put slides of cute kids underneath them. <laughs> so this slide shows the um, proposed ballot language, which I will read to you now. I'm sorry, it's a little dry, but I just want to get it all in the record. So the ballot language would read, shall the Board of, shall the Board of County Commissioners of Missoula County be authorized to sell and issue general obligation bonds of the county in one or more series in the maximum aggregate principal amount of 19 million bearing interest at rates to be determined at the time of the sale, payable semi-annually during a term as to such series of bonds, but for not more than 20 years for the purpose of paying costs of improvements to the county fairgrounds, including constructing a new livestock and horse center for youth agriculture education, developing green space, constructing a new enclosed ice sheet and related costs and improvements and costs associated with the sale and issuance of the bonds. Then there's a yes, no, and then it will also say on the ballot, if the above proposition passes and the bonds are issued in one series in the total principal amount of 19 million for a 20 year term, it is estimated based on the tax year 2021 taxable value of the county that the property taxes on a home with an assessed market value for tax purposes of $100,000 would increase by $7.44 per year and property taxes on a home with an assessed market value for tax purposes of $200,000 would increase by $14.88 per year. And if you have questions about this language, uh, Dan Simmons of Dorsey Whitney, our bond counsel is here. Um, and then finally, on our last slide, I have the recommended motion. Um, and before, and this is my, my last slide and um, I'll pull it up uh, when we get to that. But before I um, ask you guys to open the hearing, I want to introduce uh, Laura Henning of Glacier Ice Rink and Campbell Barrett of 4-H to introduce themselves and just um, say hello. To you. Use this, these ones. Either one. Okay. Is that working? Hi, I'm Campbell Barrett. I'm Missoula County's MSU Extension Agent for the 4-H Youth Development Program. I came to Missoula in 2007, and in the fall of 2008, I started attending fairgrounds redevelopment meetings and have been involved with those throughout that time uh, in large part. I would want to thank commissioners present and past, uh, community members present and past, program members who've attended those meetings and helped um, push all of the great progress that's already happened at the fairgrounds. And I will keep that introduction, cut it off there and pass the torch to Laura Henning here. This one. I feel kind of special sitting up here, I got to say. Uh, Laura Henning, Executive Director of Glacier Ice Rink. Um, Glacier Ice Rink was built 25 years ago by a group of volunteers. And since that time, we've really grown uh, immensely. Last year, we served about 25,000 individuals. And that's individuals, which equates to about over 100,000 visits during the course of the season. And that is through our skating, our hockey, and our curling programs. And like Campbell said, it's it's been a long time coming and I'm very excited that we're finally to this point. And I thank all of you for having us today. And then also thank you all to the community members who are here speaking on our behalf. Excuse me, that's it for staff reports. Just a question about ballot language. So um, I imagine a lot of people would read that ballot language and say, why put $100,000 or $200,000? Nobody has a house like that. Uh, but if I understand it right, that's dictated by statute. I just want to get some clarity. Um, well, I will let Dan speak to the statute, but the reason why we went with the $100,000 is because there's such a range of home values in Missoula and people can, can do it themselves um, by taking that $7.44 and multiply it. Um, and it was the easiest we, we thought it was the most um, transparent way to give that information. Um, and um, Dan, you're welcome to chime in if I say anything wrong, but this is Dan Simmons. He's the bond counsel um, who works for Dorsey Whitney. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Slotnick, uh, that's a good question. 
It actually is not mandated by law for a general obligation bond election. It is mandated for a mill levy election. We thought that it was in the best interests of the citizens to include it on the ballot for clarity and also to maybe avoid confusion in the event there's a mill levy question on the ballot and in which you have to say the tax impact statement. And then if you have a geo bond question on the ballot without the tax impact, it just raises unnecessary questions. So um, we thought the better course was to include the tax impact statement in the GO bond Thanks. election. Yeah, Dan, before you leave, so so why the 200,000? If, if the, the goal is to put a benchmark that you can just calculate it yourself, um, why add two instead of just leaving it at 100,000? Uh, Commissioner Strohmeyer, um, I would take that up with the legislature. <laughs> Um, I, I mean, I, I don't say that cavalierly. So that is the language uh, yeah. from a levy. It, uh, so the the fifteen ten four two five, which is a mill levy statute, says if you have a mill levy question, you have to say the tax effect on a home valued at one hundred thousand and on a home valued at two hundred thousand. Okay, okay, thank, so thank you. More. That that's helpful. It, you guys it, just went with the mill levy language to avoid. Confusion. Confusion. Yep. That is the short answer. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Okay. We'll save the long answer for later. Thank okay. you. Okay. Uh, public comment. And again, same thing. We'll try to keep it to three minutes. The chimes will go off and we'll interrupt I you. Will. Commissioners, my name is John Turner. As vice president of Ms. Before I start, would, uh, would everybody here that's in support of this Bond issue, please stand up. Wow. Love it. So my name is John Turner. As Vice President of Missoula County 4-H Council and Missoula County FFA Advisory Board member, I'm here today to ask for your three support in this geo bond, for this geo bond. In 1913, agriculturalists and business leaders like myself asked Missoula County voters for $50,000. That $50,000 was to purchase the land that eventually has become our Missoula County Fairgrounds. All of us here today are here to ask you to renew our community investment in those same fairgrounds. Currently, 4-H and FFA share space with the ICE users. It is a very frustrating use of space, as you've heard your staff report. It's very time consuming and labor intensive for three short weeks of use in the summer for our ag programs. Our volunteer leaders during the year use their homes, churches, schools, and any other available state space for those programs. In the three short weeks of the fair, those fairgrounds offer learning opportunities in agriculture, technology, animal husbandry, community involvement, for more than 400 FFA and 4-H students. With improved year-round facilities, our kids and community will have dedicated space to continue and grow these programs. Fun fact, 4-H and FFA participants are four times more likely to give back to their community and twice as likely to make healthy choices. When given opportunities to grow these programs and grow these students, why wouldn't we? I would also like to address you from my non-volunteer role in our community. Our family started our first business in Missoula in 1974. We've been paying commercial taxes since then and residential property taxes for well over 48 years. We, like most other taxpayers, cringe at tax increases. However, a bond to fund the much needed improvements on our fairgrounds as an investment in our community, our future, and our youth. The tangible benefits to many of our local businesses will be significant. The tangible benefits to our youth will be even more significant. For these reasons, the Turner family and all of our businesses 
are in full support of this tax increase. So again, I ask you three, listen to our youth. Let's put this on the ballot for our community, for our kids, and for our future. Thank you. Thank you. Under three minutes. It's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> I take directions well. My wife taught me. <laughs> so we have copies for you. Great, and just leave them with Violet. Thank you so much, John. Next. I need to push this button. There we go. Thank you for having us today. Uh, my name is Lauren Hutchison. I am an officer at First Security Bank in Midtown and have been there 15 years. Um, and I'm the president of the Missoula Midtown Association. I'm here today to show support to the Fairground General Obligation Fund and the initiative to have this voice heard on the ballot in November. Midtown is a staple in Missoula County and continues to grow. The Fairgrounds is at the center of Missoula and will be the hub of Midtown as we see the continued growth of mixed use housing and will be the, a center location for the community to gather and recreate. As we navigate solutions to the housing crisis, we will see more high density housing in our community and the Fairgrounds will be a center point for a shared public space. This space will also house a number of activities to help our local community grow, but will also create opportunities for our business community's growth with additional tourism. Midtown has continued to grow and in the last six months now has a master planning process underway to help lay out the groundwork for not only our local residents in Midtown, but our businesses as well. We are eager to see our community grow. This bond will help give our community a voice on a well thought out redevelopment vision, a voice that as Missoulians know is important to our growth, but also to our quality of life. As an ambassador of Midtown, we want to ensure every voice is heard. Thank you guys. Thank you, Lauren. Next. You guys will have to, yeah, share, get close to that microphone or pass it between you. All right. Hi, and thank you guys for taking the time to listen to us today. I am Beatrice Erickson, and I'm here today speaking on behalf of the Glacier Ice Rink as well as the Missoula yeah, get really Skating close Club. Wide. There you go. Um, I live in the South Hills, about five minutes away from the ice rink. Gus and I are both users of the fairgrounds within our respective organizations. However, we are here together today to advocate for a space that we have grown up in and now begin to grow out of. We need more space and believe that it will in turn benefit our community as a whole, not simply us. I began figure skating when I was about four years old and I've stuck with it ever since. As I've grown with the Missoula Figure Skating Club, I've learned about the opportunities and inclusivity available to me through the rink. Now I have the opportunity to coach both figure skating and hockey classes. Glacier Ice Rink regularly offers public skate activities such as pride skate, all ability skating, and skate with Grizz, and much, much more. I have watched these programs expand firsthand throughout my time at the rink. The rink has directly and indirectly afforded me opportunities that otherwise would not have, such as continuing to skate in college at the University of Victoria in British Columbia. However, in order to offer these opportunities for community connection and rink expansion, ice time has been diminished for all user groups. It is difficult as a competitive level figure skater without sufficient amounts of ice time, and by that same token, many organizations at the rink have had difficulty attracting high level coaches. For me and many others in my club, in order to continue to grow as a skater, we are forced to travel out of state in hopes of securing more ice time. I began traveling to five hours to McCall, Idaho, two times per month in eighth grade, and I'm now graduated from high school just to secure sufficient ice time. The program and attendance numbers already display that county residents support and use the rink, but we are beginning to reach maximum capacity at the fairgrounds. In order for the rink to sufficiently serve the entirety of the community, county residents are asking you to advocate for a third sheet of ice and agricultural pavilion on our behalf by placing this on the ballot. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Beatrice. Uh, my name is Gus Turner. I am the uh, FFA, Missoula FFA president, the Missoula 4-H senior ambassador, and the newly elected uh, state ambassador officer, proudly representing over 20,000 4-H members in the state of Montana. 
Uh, this new egg pavilion isn't just for me and uh, Beatrix and the people who are going to be using this ice, but it's for the kids that I see coming to my meetings and the, coming to my events that they're going to be the future and they're going to need a place to learn and expand, grow, diversify. They need a place to expand their way of life and to understand what they can do for the community and what the community has done for them. Us being all here today it just shows to them that we care for them and we understand that they need to grow, they need to learn, they need to be educated, and it's our job to kind of give them the opportunities to do that. Uh, I don't have a prepared speech as much as uh, Bia here, but uh, I just believe that having this egg pavilion is not just for kids taking steers or sheep to pigs and to the fair and stuff, but it's for kids taking archery, technology classes, communication, public speaking, uh, leadership of abilities. I mean, the possibilities are endless. We even begin to think about the different types of activities that these kids can do just because we don't have the resources and space available for it. So I hope you guys can consider to put this on the ballot. Thank you. Thank you, Gus. Next. Oh, thank you, John. I'm Ramona Holt, a rancher, a retired professional rodeo secretary and timer, and I live at Lolo. Having spent 70 years involved in the Western Montana Fair, I was chosen to give history. Pretty good idea, huh? In 1879 was the first fair. In 1911, uh, under a law passed in the legislative session, the county, this is a quote, the county will be able to support the fair more liberally than has been possible in the past. And the settlement of the commissioners is that the fair institution should be permanently established with good buildings and hearty support given to the annual fairs. The mission statement was adopted to promote ag, education, culture, recreation, community connection, and to reflect the beautiful history of Western Montana. In 41, a fire destroyed most of the buildings and the grandstand and a lot of animals. The commercial building was spared. My personal involvement with the fair history. In the 40s, I helped build the 4-H Cafe Kitchen. In the 70s, I planned and contracted for the building of the Seruptimus Bingo Booth. Harvey Klaus and I sponsored and organized a tractor driving contest for that 4-H and FFA. In the late 1980s, I planned a fair parade for the Montana Centennial. In the 1990s, my husband and I sponsored and uh, planned a event called Cowboy Logger Days, which was a rodeo, a logging competition, and a trade fair. Very successful, complete with a carnival and all kinds of uh, other activities. So my involvement has been deep with the fair. With four sons involved in the FFA programs, three seed farmers, one American farmer, one who went to nationals in public speaking. So that is a heavy, heavy program for me, along with 4-H. I went to the national convention in the 40s. So this program is really uh, very close to my heart. I, I firsthand realized the difficulties experienced during the fair. However, the community always stepped up with their time, resources, and expertise to make the fair successful. Since then, many buildings were built to be temporary, but they became permanent. The new buildings and the look of the grounds are meant to give usage for future generations and reflect the mission of the fairgrounds. I'm gonna call your attention to an article in the July 13th Missoulian this year under the guest view. It was written by two youths 
they recognized the need for the, for the help at the fairgrounds and what was needed to be done. Um, one was st stating that she attributes her success as a figure skater to the Missoula Ice Rink. She will be attending the University of British Columbia with a skating scholarship. The other contributor is a young man who's president of the 4-H club and FFA group. He contributes his success to those organizations and addresses the homecoming, the shortcomings of the fairgrounds to fully house those activities. And I quote, a third sheet of ice and separate egg livestock pavilion will help meet the growing popularity of ice programs while providing proper exhibit space for ag events and educational programs that draw hundreds of youth from across Missoula County. A core value of 4-H and FFA is to leave things better than you found them. We think these are good goals for our fairgrounds, their quotation. I'm going to leave you with this thought. Let's stand by our history from 1911 to carry out our mission adopted for the fairgrounds and the legislative action to support the fair more liberally. Please sub support this bond issue. Thank you. Thank you, Ramona. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Gary Swain, live in Sealy Lake. I'm a member of the Sealy Lake Community Council. Uh, and president of Rocks. Rocks is a regional outdoor center for kinetic sports and a regular skater at um, Glacier Ice Rink. My background includes playing professional hockey for nine years uh, and a past commissioner of two junior hockey leagues um, in the Northwest. My focus today though, uh, is the community of Sealy Lake. Uh, it's kids and families and how an additional sheet of ice in Missoula could benefit our community. One of the outdoor projects that Sealy Lake Rocks operates and maintains is an outdoor ice skating rink located right next to Sealy Lake Elementary with approximately 170 kids. The good news is that it's located right next to the school where the kids have easy access to free skates, uh, nets, uh, learning, skating learning devices on a daily basis or when classes allow. The bad news is that because the ice is totally dependent on weather, we only have ice for generally three months mid-December to mid-March. The commissioners have asked how the addition of a third sheet of ice in Missoula could benefit our community. Well, first of all, I'd be there more often, one. <laughs> Two, uh, but more importantly, as I've indicated, we can introduce kids and families to skating, but can only do so much with such a limited season that is so dependent on weather. Mild conditions, snowstorms, we're kind of out of business for a while. To really extend the benefit of year-round ice to Sealy Lake residents is to open the dialogue to the financial and geographic limitations that would need to be addressed. I completely believe the expansion would benefit Sealy, but I would encourage thoughtful and holistic approach to invitation and inclusion. By this, I mean tapping into resources like Rocks, Sealy Lake Elementary, to establish links between our outdoor skating and the additional benefits of year-round indoor skating on really good ice at Glacier. Youth scholarships, summer skating, camps, and addressing transportation needs are areas that would need to be addressed. In closing, it's a resounding yes to supporting the expansion because I have seen firsthand through volunteering how beneficial and enjoyable the sport of skating is for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. You're welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tucker Sargent, and I am the general manager of the University of Montana hockey program, as well as a participant in ice sports at the Glacier Ice Rink, namely the GHL. Uh, I moved to Missoula in 2006, really without knowing anyone, and the Glacier Ice Rink and that community really became my first community in Missoula. And sadly, it's one of the anchors that has made Missoula my permanent home when I thought of going other places. I don't know if I could replicate what the Glacier Ice Rink has done for me and making Missoula feel like home. 
Uh, the, res- the revitalized Grizz hockey program took off last season, um, and I think it filled a void for community entertainment, connection, a source of pride during the winter months. We had an average attendance of 13, 000, or 1,300 fans at our games, uh, not to mention a number of sellouts where we were actually turning people away. Uh, but it, we were able to provide a fun and social outlet for all residents of the greater Missoula community. Many of those people that attended our games haven't participated in any other activity at the Glacier Ice Rink. Uh, not only is Grizz Hockey a fantastic community experience, but we were, able, we were also able to be a major conduit to introducing children through adults to ice sports and getting them involved as well as filling restaurants, bars, hotels during game days. Some of the hurdles we have come across is scheduling our games due to the enormous and growing pressure of youth tournaments. Uh, families that ask me how to get involved once they've been to a Grizz hockey game and want to get their kids involved quickly realize <clears throat> the difficulties of finding ice time and the inadequacies of our uh, current facilities to handle the large crowds that show up for a Grizz game. With the addition of another sheet of ice that is open year round, we can allow more kids and adults to get involved with all ice sports, host more games, youth camps, recruiting. A lot of that stuff is the outreach that we're trying to do to and build and uh, build the community for hockey and more. We have figure skaters coming to our games, youth figure skaters getting an opportunity to skate at intermissions. Um, and all of that is just a major economic driver to the businesses of particularly Midtown Missoula um, and continue to drive, just can uh, build an excellent community and family experience around Grizz hockey. Thanks. Thank you, Tucker. Oh, and lastly, uh, just for fun, I looked at what Whitefish did over the summer and here's their schedule. <laughs> Could you get us the uh, local option tourist tax like Whitefish has? <laughs> Hello, my name's Amos Templer. This is my son Hudson and Finley, and we lost one because it was taking a little long, but <laughs> um, we just started playing hockey two years ago and it's come a long way. Um, there's a lot of kids out there that really love the sport. and These two are one of them and um, we just hope to, to see more ice because it's a struggle to get ice time um, and teaching the termites and stuff. They're all really excited to be out there and so we're definitely for it so finley and hudson do you have anything to say Go ahead. Save. i made lots of friends <laughs> yeah. great i think finley's he doesn't want to say much okay <laughs> thank you thank you for your time yeah. Tough act to follow those little kids. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Jerry Dellis, and I live in the Frenchtown Valley, and I'm also a member of the um, 4-H Council. Uh, 23 years ago, my eight-year-old daughter told me that she wanted to raise a pig and join 4-H. I had no idea what we were getting into. My experience had been on my family's cattle operation, and I didn't participate in 4-H at all. Um, it's really the experience that I'm here to talk to you about. My daughter and son both participated in 4-H for 11 years. They raised pigs, steers, and lambs. They participated in Western games, cooking, woodworking, and they each held leadership positions in Frenchtown Valley 4-H. Through the experience of raising animals, and projects my kids learned about life. They learned about sickness. They learned about the inevitable life cycle of having to say to a goodbye to an animal that oftentimes they loved, and yes, sometimes they hated. But through those experiences, they learned about the commitment that it takes to start a project and to finish it. They learned leadership skills, they learned responsibility, and they embodied the 4-H motto, 
which is using their hands, their hearts, their heads, and health for better living for everyone. Our current limitations of space and an adequate facility to allow more kids to have the 4-H experience is disappointing. And I believe our young people deserve so much more. I've been involved in 4-H for over 23 years now, and I've stayed involved because I believe in the power of the experience that 4-H and the agricultural industry brings to our future leaders. And I believe that our community will support our youth in having a year-round agricultural facility that will support our heritage for generations to come. I believe that this is your opportunity to voice your support for this much needed and way, way overdue investment in our young people and the community campus that we call the fairgrounds. Thank you, Jerry. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, commissioners. <clears throat> My name is Denise Elliott. I live in Evro, right on top of the hill. I am a club leader as well as a beef superintendent. I was involved in Missoula County 4-H as a child as well. Um, my four children have or are involved in, community, in Missoula County 4-H right now. And I wanna share how 4-H has impacted my children and how many more we could impact if we actually had a facility to host clinics, livestock shows, and learning events for our kids. I was in 4-H when we had barns on the fairgrounds. Granted, they were not fancy, but they were ours and we had a place to call our own. It has been over two decades since we've had any facility or barns for 4-H. It is time to make that a reality. <clears throat> My oldest daughter, Randa, was nine years old when I was first involved with the discussions about a facility on the fairgrounds. She is now 25. I wanna share a bit of how 4-H and livestock have affected her life. Randa is in her seventh year of vet school at WSU. Without a doubt, she would not be there without 4-H. I don't wanna go into a lot about her story because she is here today to share that but she is about to fulfill a huge need in our agricultural community of being a veterinarian for our large animals. Our 4-H kids are our future in agriculture and we need to have more of them. <clears throat> My youngest daughter, Callie, is not here today, but she is graduating next spring and she also intends to pursue veterinary science. Again, without 4-H, I do not believe she would be doing that. She, along with Randa, now have a small herd of cattle that are raised for show and market. Prior to 4-H, we did not have cattle. We did not have any animals. <laughs> Callie has even gone on to win the 2022 Mini Hereford World Show in Denver with her homebred and raised heifer and her prospect steer. Unfortunately, when Callie and my 12-year-old son want to practice, show, or attend clinics with their livestock, they must travel to other counties that actually have facilities where they can host these events. <clears throat> We, as Missoula County, are home of the Western Montana Fair, but we sadly do not have a place to host these learning opportunities for our children. These events bring in hundreds of exhibitors and their families. What an economic impact that could have on our community as well as our children. As a final thought, my girls have a bumper sticker that reads, an industry that feeds us is an industry worth fighting for. How powerful is that statement? And as youth, they understand that. We should be fighting for agriculture in our community and our children who are involved in it. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, briefly mentioned, I'm the oldest daughter. <laughs> so <laughs> my name is Randa Bowler, I'm also an Evero resident. So I've been involved with Missoula County 4-H in some capacity since I joined at nine years old. I continue to volunteer at clinics, help at fair interviews, judge at the fair, and offer my time and knowledge to members of all ages. And this is for one reason. 4-H has given me most of the opportunities that allowed me to be where I am today. I believe it is my honor to give back to this organization. Uh, this fall, I'll be heading into my third year of veterinary school at Washington State University College of Veterinary Medicine with a plan to specialize in production animal medicine with an interest in reproduction. I also attended WSU for my undergraduate degree in animal sciences. This is only possible through scholarships received through and because of 4-H. In my time as a member, I gained priceless leadership experience, even holding the position of state officer in 2014 to 2015. Had it not been for 4-H, for I would not have found my love for agriculture. 
the love for the people within the egg industry, and of course, the love for the animals. Without 4-H, the chances I would be here at this level of education, just years away from my doctorate in veterinary medicine, uh, would have been slim to none. The experiences and knowledge gained could not have been replaced, and it provided a foundation that holds strong to this day. Thank you. Thank you, Rhonda. Hello, my name is Leah Nelson, and I live in Potomac. I'm about to begin my sophomore year at Big Sky High School. I'm a member of Potomac Valley 4-H in the Missoula FFA chapter. I became involved in 4-H because I followed in my older sister's footsteps. As I grew in 4-H, it was obvious to me that 4-H provides unique opportunities with a lifelong impact. Now at the end of my first year in FFA, I see that my involvement in FFA will again increase opportunities for my personal growth and skill building. A few of the most notable skills I have learned are public speaking, leadership, and time and money management. My personal experience in 4-H has centered around breeding and raising sheep. There, there's few better ways to learn lessons of service, responsibility, and selflessness than through raising and caring for livestock. The addition of an ag and livestock arena at the fairgrounds would allow for more kids from Missoula County to share in the experiences I have to come to cherish. 4-H and FFA happen year round, not just one week in August. If we had a de dedicated facility, the sky's the limits for the type and number of ag related events we could host all year round. I, along with others from 4-H and FFA communities, travel to the state to compete in livestock shows and learn from other showmen. We would love to have facilities in Missoula for such competitions and educational clinics. The positive economic impacts generated from hosting such events go beyond the fairgrounds and into the community at large. During fair week, a dedicated facility would provide the proper setting for housing livestock. We make what we have work, but safety and security are not at the level that our showmen and livestock should have. 4-H and FFA are a way of life for me and my family. I am proud of this and want to share the power of youth with all Missoula County and beyond. A dedicated ag and livestock facility will absolutely benefit the entire county and provide the chance to expand positive influence of 4-H and FFA in our community. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, Leah. Anyone else in Sophie Moise? Good afternoon. I'm Philip Keating. I'm a Missoula County resident and I'm not playing in Candy Crush on my phone. <laughs> um, I actually, I have the notes on there, so uh, thank you for adding this to the agenda. It's important to hear today. I'm here in support of placing the fairgrounds improvement proposal on the ballots for the voters. I was born and raised in Montana and per participated in 4-H growing up. I'm probably one of the 4% that he spoke of earlier. Uh, and I'm thankful for the lessons, values, and life skills that I learned. I'm here today to also represent the Firefighters Hockey Foundation. Um, I'm part of the Missoula Firefighters Bomberos hockey team, and we have dozens of members that participate in the leagues. We also hold the Fire and Ice hockey game that's been in Missoula for the past 10 years. Um, and we've always struggled to find suitable time to hold the events due to overlap with youth sports, adult sports, grizz hockey, figure skating, and curling. The, fund rate, the funds raised by the fundraiser go to the Missoula Community in Need and the Wildfire, Wildland Firefighter Foundation uh, for firefighters that have been injured or died in the light of duty. So I recommend a due pass and I thank you for your time. Thank you, Philip. Sorry, I'm too tall. Uh, hello, my name is Lee Banville. Um, I'm the president of the Missoula Curling Club and a resident over on 9th Street. Uh, I'm here uh, to ask you to endorse the idea of placing this bond on the ballot for the fall because we see the different communities. You started to see the different communities that are represented here. In fact, I'm an ice user. I'm, I'm unique because I'm an ice user who cannot skate. Uh, <laughs> And uh, don't let my physical presence throw you. Uh, curling is a sport that almost anyone can play. Uh, 
Uh, we have players who are as young as eight and as old as 80 uh, currently playing in Missoula among our 200 members. We've had more than a thousand students try curling, but because of the limitations of ice time, um, primarily we play between nine and midnight on Saturdays, we don't have a lot of youth curlers um, because of that. And so this opportunity allows us to take advantage of the, the breadth of age and participatory ability uh, to open curling to more people. Um, curling is also a sport that, um, if you've watched the Paralympics, you'll know, is also highly accessible. And yet that's also another thing we've not been able to fully take advantage of because of, you know, we have many ice users. And so finding the time to allow, uh, you know, to get it ready for um, uh, wheelchairs on ice and such takes time. And so that's what's at a premium at the current setup at the Glacier Ice Rink. We appreciate the work done by uh, the fairgrounds as well as the Glacier Ice Rink to build the sports that you see represented before you, as well as the community uh, involvement in 4-H and other agricultural communities. And we see this as a great opportunity to not only um, support what is happening here, but actually build a future for both communities, all these communities that could benefit from such a facility. So we ask for your re support respectfully. Thank you. Thanks, Lee. you guys are intimidating. Oh. My name is Maurice Austin. I'm here uh, asking for your support. Um, I was asked to come by to speak to you all in support of a dream that we all have. I think it's the best way. I'm sorry. This is emotional to me because these people all here, our family, I don't have it. They are it. So, uh, hang on. My wife says I'm a 59 year old rink rat. She's offered many times to come down to the rink, pay rent so that I can stay at the rink because for some reason I'm a person that when I come home at midnight, one o'clock in the morning after playing, everybody's awake. I'm not real quiet about it. We drive from Tura to out, which we live out past Bonner in here multiple times a week to play league games, to help substitute, to work on the computer system for the rink, uh, bring my grandchildren in to skate, uh, do public skates. Uh, I'm in charge of security for the UM Grizz hockey, so there's my potential Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night. Um, I'm not complaining. I, I, I live for it. it. It's what I do. It's I work. And if you ask my kids what else I do, it's hockey. So it, it, I started a hockey life shortly after I had both my knees replaced, which is now going on 10 years. About the same time, my wife and I discovered the Missoula Maulers. I got pretty excited because that's when I found out that there is hockey available for old new skaters like me. Um, at that time, there was a gentleman by the name of Eric Penn and Trevor McLeod that took uh, me in under their wing, spent countless hours with me, showing me things, uh, numerous skating clinics, uh, worked hours and hours. One of the old timers, older than me, at the rink one day looked at me and says, I'm getting away from you because you're big enough, you're going to hurt somebody. So that gave me the drive to succeed more than what I was doing at that time. Uh, I didn't know that Ryan was here, but I wound up taking some skating lessons from Ryan, which were like put me over the top. About six weeks after I started skating, I went and had my first game. And I walked in and they asked me, do you know what offsides is? And I said, well, yeah, I do. I watch Mahlers. And they said, OK, you're better than most of us. So three weeks after that was my first goal. That set the hook. I'm hockey for life. Uh, spent countless hours down volunteering, helping out, um, donating, donating uh, skates and hockey gear. I do a lot of yard sale stuff, so I find this equipment out and about. I pick it up and take it down and give it to the rink so that the, the kids that can't afford this have some equipment to use. Um, I don't know, I'm lost way bad, but. Uh, I have a lot of physical problems and 
this is my activity of choice. I fall down, I get back up and away we go again. Uh, when I used to race mountain bikes, I fall down. I generally wound up in the hospital. So my wife kind of likes this a little bit better. So anyways, I, I want to say please support it. Let this happen. Uh, I'm one of the old farts. It, it's not all just the kids and the FFA, they rock. I mean, that stuff is just awesome. So we need more of it. Thank you. Thanks, Maurice. All right, good afternoon. Thanks for having us all here today. My name is Ryan Yuris. <clears throat> I live on Eddy Avenue, just over the river here in the heart of Missoula. And I'm here today as the president of the Glacier Ice Rink Board of Directors. I'm also very involved with the Missoula Figure Skating Club and the public programs at the ice rink. And as you guys have heard, we're here today because of the success of a really unique public-private partnership that's evolved over the last 25 years. The Glacier Ice Rink was really fortunate to find a home on the Missoula County Fairgrounds, sharing that space typically reserved for 4-H and FFA. And in that shared space, we welcome 110,000 plus visits on ice, in addition to the thousands that come during the fair week. These, these visits provide invaluable recreation and educational opportunities for our community. Both organizations have maxed out capacity to grow our programs and encourage further public use. We ask that the commission and the community support that continued expansion of our fairground buildings, including the new ice rink and the livestock equestrian facility. Glacier Ice Rink is planning further fundraising for the third sheet of ice and upgrades to our existing ice facilities, in addition to the general obligation bond we are seeking. This third sheet of ice will allow GIR to offer expanded public programming, accommodate increased ice time demand for all user groups, and promote lifelong recreational opportunities. Both new facilities plan to make excellent use of a fine public space and encourage year round activity on the fairgrounds. Our collaboration between ICE, AG, and the county, it's unique and it's special. Our relationships are stronger than ever, and together we can impact even more Missoula County residents. Both facilities will certainly serve as regional hubs for hockey tournaments, figure skating competitions, curling bond spiels, equestrian events, and livestock showings. The ICE events alone generate $1.9 million in economic impact during our typically slower winter months in this town. I've been part of the Missoula ICE community for almost 20 years, and I've spent the last five years serving on the board, the GIR board of directors. I've had the honor of serving as president for the last two, and I could not be more proud of the work that this group has accomplished. We've celebrated our growth and recognized our role as a community focused recreation leader for all types of ICE activities and public programs. We've amended our bylaws to be more inclusive, eliminating any membership requirement to join. Our board and organizational structure is focused on the big picture promoting sustainability within the organization and establishing current nonprofit best practices. We've accomplished all of this with the goal of honoring our 25 year legacy while setting a foundation to build upon for the next 25 years and beyond. So thank you all for listening to all of us today and for your consideration of the community investment projects on our Missoula Fairgrounds. Thanks, Ryan. Good afternoon, commissioners. I'm Clarence Wildeboer. I live south of the city in Missoula County. I am the president of the Missoula County 4-H Council and the former president of Glacier Ice Rink Board of Directors. I'm the proud father of four. I had written down boys. I realize I look up to all of them now, so I'm the proud father of four young men who are 4-H members and are also hockey players. I also spend a considerable amount of time at the rink as a coach, as a player, and as a referee. It's a privilege and an honor to speak to you today about something I, I feel so passionately is valuable for our community. It's also pretty humbling to speak uh, after so many folks uh, giving the history. Uh, it's the Randa, it's the B, it's the Gus, it's the Lee of the world that are that are future leaders. They're gonna be filling your seats in, in the future and, and that to me is exciting. 
we ask you today to, to continue to support the momentum to invest in the fairgrounds. You've heard how unfortunate it is that the valuable agriculture and recreation programs growth have been stifled on account of the current facility limitations. These programs that develop life skills from cooking to teamwork, food preparation to healthy physical and mental fitness. These programs help youth, they help parents, leaders and coaches learn how to compete, how to win with humility and, and to lose with grace. I'll be traveling to Bozeman uh, this weekend for one out of six long weekends this summer, unfortunately to participate in ice sports because they have year round ice that we can't support here yet. That state program happens there because they have a facility that they're able to use for ice 12 months a year. The collaboration, as Ryan just mentioned, between 4-H, FFA, and the ICE community has never been better. And I would also testify that it's, it's required, it's fundamental, and it's critical due to the fact that we share space. But if we respectfully understand that sharing space isn't sharing the same space at the same time, it's ultimately taking turns in the limited space we have available. That leads to the other weekends that we're not in Bozeman participating in ice sports. It's the effort to set up the fairgrounds, to take down ice, to set up pens, and at the end of the summer to return and, and set up ice again. Uh, a shout out to the Missoula Public Library this week, um, being recognized internationally as the premier library in the world. Um, I think that's the very thing we aspire to be in the community, and that's what we can have a vision for on our fairgrounds as well. As we have learned and been reminded of throughout the COVID pandemic, the value of community, of education, of local health, healthy recreation is critical to the fabric of our local public. As we're reminded of the Missoula Fairgrounds being a hub, a community asset for the city, for the county, for the region and beyond, let's fully support the next steps of development in that asset. It's unfortunate that valuable agriculture and recreation programs are limited, Let's provide the needed space for 4-H, FFA, and ice sports at the Glacier Ice Rink facility. On behalf of the groups and individuals represented here today, including the more than 450 signers on the community request letter, thank you for considering this request. I strongly encourage you to place the fairgrounds bond question on the fall ballot so the Missoula County voters will have the opportunity to invest in the development of our leaders of today, and tomorrow by continuing valuable investments in our Missoula County Fairgrounds. Thank you. Thanks, Clarence. Anyone else in Sophie Maurice? We have some folks online. Okay, no one else is in the room, so Heather. Hi everybody, my name is Heather Wills and I live up in Potomac and I'm a livestock producer, but mostly I wanted to talk today about the fairgrounds and placing this bond measure on the ballot. Uh, I spent the first 21 years of my life at the fairgrounds one week a year because my brother was eight years older than I was, so I started out as a baby and then I showed myself. And in those days, like was mentioned before, we each individually had separate barns for each uh, different type of livestock. So there were lots of different barns, but the idea of putting us all under one building and one one place where we all can gather and learn is a true benefit for the future of agriculture. Um, I also want to talk about as a livestock producer, the opportunities this provides for future um, existence of li livestock being raised in our area. Many of the different breeds have junior associations and those associations have summer shows where they allow kids to bring in their animals to compete against each other and show against each other and, and learn how to be better, better leaders in their breed as well as their community. And this facility may provide that opportunity to bring in not only people from our community, but around the state as well as regionally. Also, we have to remember the stockyards is not always uh, a consistent partner that's always for sale, it seems. And so those the uh, area 
uh, purebred breeders have their sales there now, but that may not always be the opportunity. And maybe in the future, this facility could be in a place where uh, area breeders could sell their bulls as well. Um, <clears throat> I just, you know, if you know me, you know I would never want to raise taxes on myself but <laughs> or our operation. So you know how valuable this is to me and my family. My dad showed at this at the fairgrounds and all his siblings. I showed and my siblings and it put us through college, all of us. So uh, it's very, very important. In fact, when we go to say after the pledge of the to the United States, I immediately throw up my hand to say I pledge my head and start the 4-H pledge. So it's vitally important, but also I want to include and thank all the ice folks for being there. My uh, nephew Marcus plays hockey and he's found a true passion in that. So uh, we're a well rounded family of support for this bond being placed on the ballot. And I thanks for the uh, thank you for the time to comment. Thanks so much, Heather. Violet, I'm sorry, I can't see if there's anyone else online. Yeah, if folks online will just have to either raise your hand using Microsoft Teams or if you're calling in and want to comment, you'll have to hit star six on your keypad. OK, I don't think we have any more comments. Should we close public comment? You guys OK with that? OK, Commissioner, discuss. Qu question? Any questions? Could Emily, so if I remember right, this uh, the funding package here was a nice mix of uh, private and public. Would you mind describing that? Yeah, I'm actually going to pass that off to Laura Sorry. for that because okay. um, that is for the ice piece. And so the eight million, we'd use eight million from the bond, from the GO bond. We'd also plan on getting a revenue bond for three million and then undertake a capital campaign for five to eight million. So that would also help do the existing rink, do some much needed upgrades to the existing rink. Great, thanks. And just for folks out there in the world who aren't local government nerds, a revenue bond means you all, we borrow the money, you pay it back pay through back. revenue you generate, not not on not on taxpayers. Yes, and we currently have one that uh, we have, well, I guess we've got two you're right almost, now. You're almost done. We're almost done with them, yes. Yeah, so I just wanted to highlight that you all were paying back a loan and privately raising money as well. So for the for the new ice facility, about half of that will be funded from that community. Yeah, thanks everyone for sticking with us today. You got kind of a double header here in terms of uh, other things that we were wrestling with, but thank you. And we've heard today from folks from Sealy to Lolo to Potomac to Evero to Frenchtown to Tura and all places in between, including the heart of Missoula. I think you all have made a pretty compelling case how this bond and these facilities will potentially benefit all of Missoula County residents. And I look forward to putting the question to the voters in Missoula County whether they want to move forward with this. And I'm ready to make a motion. If we're, I'll uh, go ahead and make the formal motion. I would move that we adopt a resolution submitting to the qualified electors of Missoula County the question of issuing general obligation bonds in one or more series in the amount aggregate principal amount of $19 million for the purpose of paying costs of improvements to the county's county fairgrounds, including constructing a new livestock and horse center, for youth agricultural education, developing green space, constructing a new enclosed ice sheet and related costs and improvements, and paying costs associated with the sale and issuance of the bonds. I'll second that, and I just want to make a comment. Uh, the presentations we heard today were incredibly compelling, as Dave said, reflective of the widespread breadth of geography and users we have in Missoula County. And I would say to you all, if you make the same type of presentation to the voters as you made here today, I imagine you will be successful. Fantastic. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you all.
Thank you. Great.